Hi, I'm Scruffy Looking RGB, and I take you on refurbing, modding, and retro game hunting adventures all over Japan. Are you a fan of the Famicom Disk System? <sighs> probably one of the most charming retro gaming systems for those of us that collect retro video games. This little box of nostalgia has a lot of interesting history and an equally interesting gaming library. It's one of the most fun retro game systems not released outside of Japan. I mean, just look at these little yellow discs. It doesn't get more nostalgic and cute than this, right? Well, in today's video, I'll be showing you step by step how to refurbish one of these bad boys that I picked up from a recent hunting adventure at the Tokyo City Flea Market. So without further ado, let's get scruffy looking. Sorry about that, R2. This is the Famicom Disk System. It was released all the way back in 1986 and retailed for 15,000 yen. The games also were set to sell for around 2,500 yen each. It was a way to cut down on the expense of cartridge-based games because it was cheaper to produce disk-based games instead. Interesting points about the Disk System hardware is that you can have two options for the power. You can use six C-sized batteries. There's an AC adapter that can be purchased separately. I often go with the batteries because the less cords, the better. I found the power consumption is also quite low, and no joke, my batteries have lasted for the past three years. <sighs> this is the RAM adapter for the disk system that you insert into your Famicom cartridge slot. I'm sure you noticed the familiar shape on the underside here. It has a loading light for when the disk is being read, and a nice yellow eject button. Of course, the complimentary burgundy red Famicom color. It was really well designed to complement the original red and white Famicom. Disassembly of the outer shell. There are six screws in the bottom side located here. Once those are out, the top pulls off quite nicely to reveal the drive. Then six more screws, four on the drive and two on the battery holder above. You don't need to remove the battery holder, but it's really hard to remove the power board connector on the back of the drive if you don't. You'll see what I mean in a moment and lift the drive slightly and pull up the face of the shell. Be careful with the wire connected to the LED indicator. There is one screw to remove. Now this is one annoying point. The cable that goes from the power board to the drive unit is really held in tight. So if you don't remove the screws on the battery holder, you will have a difficult time getting enough grip to disconnect this cable. It has 18 pins, so be cautious not to bend any of them. This is the very crumbly belt that is used to spin the drive, and you'll find these little bits here and there inside your disk system. Remove the power board by taking out the two screws holding it down. Then remove the four inner drive feet. Let's remove the original stickers so they don't get damaged in the water. I like to use lighter fluid here. It loosens up the sticker so you can keep it intact and put it in some wax paper. Then you can reapply it after the shell is clean. I'm being very careful not to damage the label. I'm just using the blade here to lift up. This is wax paper, so the sticker stays nice and safe until we decide to reapply it. The sticker will retain its original stickiness. Now let's remove the serial number and keep it safe in the wax paper too. Good. Put it in a big book to keep them straight until you use them again. Lighter fluid will also make a quick work of the leftover sticker residue. While we're at it, might as well remove these nasty old rubber feet, since there's only three of them left. Lighter fluid will make your job much easier. I think I'll put some brand new feet on here at a later time. She is ready for a deep cleaning now. Let's give the shell a nice bubble bath and place all your parts into a tub and wash it in some warm and soapy water. So fresh and so clean. So fresh and so clean, clean. Disassembly of the drive unit. Be careful when removing the drive unit because it's made of metal and there are sharp edges. There are three screws to remove from the back of the drive unit. Don't remove the recessed screw in the upper right corner just yet. Here is what is left of our crumbly old rubber drive. It is well fused to the gold spindle here, 
and the white plastic wheel here too. So to get in, we have to remove these four screws on the drive circuit board. Pay attention to where the screws go because there are three different types of screws here. Before we remove them, we have to loosen up some wires on the opposite side of the drive unit. There are three locations to pay attention to. You will need a strong prying tool for two of them. I'm just using my screwdriver. Just pry up the little hooks here and there. And also make sure these wires are on the outside of this little hook here. Now we can remove the screws. The first one here is the one with the flat head. The one diagonally across from it has a cog looking washer on it. And then the other two opposite of each other are just the basic dome shaped screws. There is a white connector. I like to remove this because it allows for more space and you don't need to worry as much about ripping it off on accident while working on the drive belt. It's a bit of a pain, but just go slow and take your time. In my opinion, it's worth it to remove while you replace the belt and do your cleanup. Clean up the remaining rubber belt. I don't know how these rubber belts get fused to this little spindle here, but they're really stubborn to remove. I like to use a non-metal object to scrape at it, like this wood cushy stick or a plastic sharp edge. Then if you add a little IPA on a cotton swab, the process tend to go much faster. Finally, it's free of the old rubber belt remnant. Removing the metal retainer and gear wheel. There are three long screws. Once the screws are out, it becomes very loose and you want to rotate it clockwise and pull it slightly up and out to the left. It takes a little bit of force to do, Use the force. but it's not terribly difficult. Just to repeat, I want to show you the motion I use a few times here. Rotate it clockwise and pull it slightly up and out to the left. When it's time to put it back, you'll want to do the same way, but in the opposite direction, of course. Here is a little piece of belt I forgot about. If you look closely, there's a tiny bit of belt residue left behind. Let's give it a quick wipe with a cotton swab and some IPA. Installing the new belt. This is a Mobilon band. I bought this bag off of Amazon a few years back. I'll leave a link in the description. They are made in Japan, they are made of latex, and they are sulfur free, so that's good enough for me. The clear nature of it makes it a little hard to see, unfortunately, but you want to orient it on the metal retainer like so before you return it to its home. This can be quite a fiddly process. And pull the other end around the opposite side as shown. I'm using my finger to hold it in place so it doesn't slip off and get tangled. But you can add a piece of tape here if you prefer that way. Then your fingers are free to concentrate on replacing the metal retainer piece. Once the metal retainer has been reseated properly, you want to wrap the band around the two wheels, the tiny gold wheel and then the big white wheel. Try not to kink the belt like I did here. I managed to finagle the belt and get it straight. It only took me two tries here, but when it is in, you should not have any kinks. It should be resting on the white wheel and gold wheel like so. Removing the spring-loaded top. This is the scariest part of this refurbish because of the tiny three springs you must remove. The point here is to hold one side of the spring while unhooking it or it may fly off and get lost really easily. A pair of tweezers will really come in handy for this. Use a finger to hold the top side of the spring and use the tweezers to unhook the spring. Then pull the spring off safely and store it in a nice safe place. Repeat the process for the other two springs. You also have to remove the face plate of the drive by taking out these two screws. Now the top will come off you might need to use your tweezers to release the white latch. Now we can see the spindle head and a lot of grime and dust that's built up over the years. 
Use this opportunity to do a little cleaning with IPA and a cotton swab. If you remove any of the grease, make sure to replace it afterward. It keeps the gears moving smoothly. Aligning the spindle head. You want to focus on this point here. There are three layers of metals that you need to line up to make what looks like a hole. We want to line them, but we have to get the drive in a certain spot before we can do that. So if we flip the drive over, you can see by moving the gear here with your finger, you can get the drive to slowly cycle. It takes quite a bit of force from your finger to get this moving. Once it gets to that point, you should hear a click of the drive. At this point, we stop spinning the gear. Now we want to align the spindles flat side with the screw to be facing the disc reader. So you'll need a tiny Allen wrench for this job. Make it loose, spin it to face the black arm, tighten it back down, and your disc system has been aligned. Let's get everything back together and see how our refurbing work has gone. When you return the top of the drive, make sure to lift the spring-loaded arm up so that it rests above the top piece of plastic. Be careful with the little springs, one finger on the bottom while you connect the top. Reseat the cables and wires. Note the black lever may need to be guided into its hole when returning the circuit board to its home. Reseat the cables and wires. Replace the screws in their correct locations. The bottom of the drive should latch at this point first to line up well. Return the three screws, add the front plate. Let's add some new silicone grease to the posts here to keep this machine running smoothly. If you really want to help improve the quality of the channel, please consider donating by way of super thanks. Just click the heart with the dollar sign and choose the amount you'd like to donate. It'll help upgrade the quality of future videos. Plus, R2 could really use a new motivator. But if you can't, that's okay too. Just remember to subscribe to the channel and click the bell so you will get to see new retro game hunts, mods, and refurbs from here in Japan. Because it's free. And it happens every week. Well, it is the moment of truth, everyone. We have our fresh and clean, realigned FDS hooked up to the original AV modded Famicom to a nice little Sony PVM. Let's cross our fingers and see what happens here. Use the force. Yes, it's alive and well. I'm so happy we're able to bring this one back to life. Now that you know how to easily refurb your Famicom disc system, when are you gonna try refurbishing one of these amazing pieces of history? Do you have any advice for me on how I could improve my refurbishing methods here? Or if you just wanna share why you like to collect for the Famicom disc system, let me know about it down in the comments. Thank you all for hanging out with me for this refurbishing tutorial and repair. Hope you're all staying safe, but above all, stay scruffy looking. Who's scruffy looking?